And you may be seated. Our spoke is scripture comes from the epistle, from uh, the letters to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of bondage, of slavery, to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption. When we cry out, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified in him. May God add God's blessing to the hearing and the receiving of those words. And let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as I mentioned at the beginning of worship, we are at the halfway mark in Lent. That time that we try to get out of Lent a lot. We try to move right to Easter right away. We don't like to spend too much time. And now we're in the middle of it. We're in the middle of it. And we're in the middle of a sermon series based on uh, listen, praying in a noisy world. Our prayer practice this week is meditation, as I mentioned. It's also known as Lectio Divina. And in that handout has all the process of just staying with scripture. It's a way of meditating on the scripture. It is an ancient prayer practice. Everyone needs help. There's a wonderful story in this week's lesson and listen, praying in a noisy world. It's told by Ronald Greer. He is the author of a book called, If You Know Who You Are, you will know what to do. It's a great example of asking for help and being able to receive it. Ronald was sitting in an airport waiting to board the plane. And as he stood to walk towards the line that was forming, he heard a girl ask her mother, do I stand up now? There was something about her voice that caught Ronald's attention. She was developmentally disabled. He kept walking, and he got in line, and he boarded the plane. He found his seat. He sat down. And after he settled down, he looked up, and there was this girl coming down the aisle by herself, and he was surprised to see that she was a teenager, and the seat right in front of his was hers. Then a bunch of college students came down the aisle that he described as Animal House, and if any of you have familiar with that movie, you can picture the scene. They were joking around, having a good time, but above all else, they were being cool, really cool. Finally, the plane pushed back and began taxiing. Ten minutes later, the pilot announced that they were cleared for takeoff. He made the final turn on the runway. And just then, Ronald looked up and he saw the little head with the brunette hair leaned partway across the aisle, and he heard the girl say to one of the college students across from her, I get nervous when the plane takes off. Will you hold my hand? Well, 
Ronald's eyes were riveted on the college student, wondering, what is this kid going to do? After an initial nervous blush, the college student began to smile. And halfway across the aisle came this kid's hand to hold on to this young girl. The young, the tiny girl grabbed and squeezed it, and there they held hands until the jet took off. Ronald watched with disbelief, and he memorized the sacred moment, for he knew, in his words, I knew I was witnessing a sacrament. The plane wheels clunked into place. They let go of each other's hands. And Ronald couldn't hear what the rest of the conversation was because of the engine noise. For the next hour and a half, the college student read his book and the young girl listened to her iPod. And then the plane descended and approached Shreveport. In those few moments, as they anticipated the, jo the jolt of the landing, this young man turned to the girl, and Ronald read his lips and asked, do you need to hold my hand? And apparently, she said no. He smiled, and he nodded. Everyone needs help. Our epistle lesson this morning says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery, of bondage, to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption. Two of my favorite Bible scholars, theologians, one is Walter Brueggemann, Brueggemann, who is an, uh, specializes in Old Testament prophets, and the other is Ched Myers. He specializes in the New Testament, and in particular, Mark. They say, and I agree with them, there is only really one main story in the Bible, one main paradigm, one main template, one main pattern in the Bible, and that is the journey of slavery in Egypt to covenant in Mount Sinai. The governing pattern of our faith is a journey from bondage, whatever that is, to covenant. It is a journey that we keep making over and over again. Remember it took them 40 years in the wilderness? Tim Meyer says we constantly are making that same journey, going back into the wilderness and coming back out. And the reason we keep doing this is because Pharaoh, Pharaoh has immense power, immense power, and draws all of us back into bondage, back into slavery. Now, there are many kinds of pharaohs in our lives. And one of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, gospel stories this comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. It's the story of Lazarus. On well, the confirmation class, had a fun time acting this story out, and we were hoping we would act it out this morning, but instead we're going to be acting it out probably at Easter. But anyway, this, as the story goes, Jesus is off with the disciples, and his friends, Mary and Martha, are off in Bethany with their brother Lazarus. And Lazarus gets really, really sick. So Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, come quickly. For my brother is sick, we need your help. Well, Jesus was doing what Jesus was doing, and Jesus finally got to Bethany, and Lazarus was already dead. He had been dead for four days, so we really know he's dead, because after three days, you might not be dead, but four days, you're really dead. And, and after four days, um, he was stinking. He was really stinking. And in those days, when someone died, they would wrap the person up in white cloths, they put them in a, a cave and roll a rock. So Jesus comes, his friend Lazarus dies, and this is one of the texts that tells you, Jesus was so moved, he cried. He first cried. And then, the next thing he did was he said, 
Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus did come out. But that wasn't the end of the story. Lazarus, then Jesus said, unbind him, unwrap him. The community, he couldn't just stand there. He had to be unbound by the friends, by the people that were there. Everyone needs help. There are many things that can bind us. Economic systems that we find ourselves in, illnesses, cancer, addiction, depression, and other mental illnesses. This Thursday, March 19th, the National Alliance on Mental Illness will be at the state capitol, and I heard you all talking about what's going on with the legislature. But I just want to share that, that the that NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, will be at the state capitol educating legislators about the importance of mental health services and the need for adequately funded staff, funded and staffed adult and children's mental health systems. In this past month, a number of my colleagues in the metro, Des Moines metro area, have been either participated in or have been um, helping serve grieving the loss of two middle school children who died by suicide. I use that word die by suicide, not commit suicide. We don't commit cancer. We die from cancer. We die from suicide. And there is also a death of a veteran who requested psychological assistance for PTSD, post-traumatic stress, stress disorder, who had been told there would be several week wait before he could see a counselor. Questions remain in the hearts of many as to, could more have been done? There is no question that more could have been done. But these are some of the statistics the bishop shared with us. Bishop Trimble said that one in four persons experiences a mental health issue in America. One in 10 children experience periods of major depression. Approximately 120,000, that's 4.1% of the people in Iowa live with a serious mental illness such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or a major depression. Iowa should have at least 1,500 psychiatric beds for the severely mentally ill. We only have 750. Some of the nurses here know firsthand about this. In the past five years, we have closed 80 psychiatric beds, leaving only 10 dedicated psychiatric beds in Des Moines, in Des Moines, for all of Iowa's veterans. There are approximately, and this is the sobering statistic, that 80,000 youth in Iowa have a severe emotional disorder. In other words, children who have mental illness. And the statistics are numbing. 50% of students over the age of 14 who have a mental illness will drop out of school. 70% of youth in the juvenile justice system have a mental illness. 90% of those who die by suicide have a mental illness, and only 20% of children with mental illness are identified and receive services. And the sad word is that Iowa is 44th in the nation for the number of psychiatric providers per person. The bishop says that, and we know this, that United Methodist Church has had a strong, strong legacy of responding to the physical and mental needs of all people, whether they're local, whether in the wider community, or in the world. Because, and why is this? The scriptures this morning kind of testify to it. It's because our model is Jesus, who had compassion and healed those besieged by mental illness. Everyone needs help. Even Lazarus, coming out of the tomb, needed to be unbound by the community. 
our story is about one of being in bondage and being released. Our bishop says at the end of every letter, be encouraged. And the reason why he can talk about these staggering numbers, we can live with family members who have mental illness, is because we know the rest of the story. We can help. We can remember that that spirit, speaking to my spirit, speaking to your spirit, tells you that you are a child of God. Do not go back into the spirit of bondage, but be free. Thanks be to God. Let us enter into a time of silence.
Are there any joys this morning? Prayers of thanksgiving. Are there any prayers of concern this morning? Well, the flowers that are here this morning are from Violetta Schuhart's um, service that was here on Wednesday morning. So we keep her family, Don, and all of her family in our prayers this morning and uh, in the days ahead. Are there any others? Prayers of concern. And let us pray. It is hard to be in the middle of anything, O oh God. And here we are, in the middle of Lent. We can begin well with enthusiasm and commitment. And we can end well with joy and celebration. But we need your presence to make the middle meaningful. Heal what we have been. And listen in these moments of stillness to what we want to become. Recreate us and renew us as we journey through Lent that we might come to know this mystery of faith that we are loved far more than we deserve. Help us to claim this truth as our own. Awaken us to the reality that you loved us enough to give us your beloved son. And in thanksgiving for this gift of love, inspire us to so love others. As we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Give those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And let us now, um, as we come to this great time that we get to share our gifts, let us now offer our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings for God's work here in this community, in this church, in this state, in the conference, and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
please join with me in this prayer. Bless these gifts that we give today, for we lift our eyes and see there is much we can do to bring about wholeness and healing in our world. May they contribute in bringing light to dark places. Amen. And please remain standing for the servant song. It's found in the black hymnal number 2222. We're going to see, sing all six verses. <laughs> 